the eternal God came into the world in the person of his Son. And the Son of God himself gave his life to pay the debt of our sin, that we might be set free from the judgment of sin, from the terror of hell, and be released for an endless future of joy with him. Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. And today we continue a message we began last time, taking a look at our eternal God. And Jonathan, what a thing for us to spend some time thinking about. If we know Christ, we are going to be able to spend our eternity separated from sin, evil, all pain, suffering, that is gone. And we are going to be in the presence of, of Jesus forever. That's at the heart of gospel hope. But it is founded in this incredible reality, grounded in this truth, that the eternal God, the one who always was and always is and always will be, stepped into this temporal world in the person of his Son, in the miracle of the Incarnation. He became one of us and lived among us that he might purchase our redemption at Calvary. And it's a, it's, a, it's a marvelous thought, a wonderful thought, a mind-stretching thought that the eternal God did this in the person of his Son. And, and, and the fact that he did is the, is the basis of our hope. It is the heart of the gospel. Well, we're going to continue to look at that today, so I hope you'll stay with us as we continue our message, The Eternal God. Here is Jonathan. What then does the eternity of God mean for us? What are the implications of this very great truth? Let me suggest four, four things that the eternity of God gives to us and means for us. First of all, the eternity of God gives us confidence, confidence in God and in His Word. I don't know if you ever feel this way, but I tend to think that one of the most high-trust relationships we have in our lives is the relationship that we have with our dentist. <laughs> You know, we need to trust and believe that the person, the man or woman who's allowed to wield needles and drills within our open mouth, we need to believe that they are competent. We need to believe that they are kindly disposed toward us, that they are knowledgeable, and that they are trustworthy. When we moved here to Ottawa, one priority for us as a family was to find a good dentist. It just happened that the dentist located nearest to our house was someone with whom we had a family connection going way back many years. He was very well respected in the community. Everyone was jostling to get on his list and to get into his clinic. He kindly invited us in, and we had our checkups and so on, and we just thought, this is the best dentist we have ever had in our whole lives. He is just outstanding. Anyway, we'd been here just a little over a year when he shared with us the news that he was planning to retire. He was selling the practice. He was winding down. Now, for as long as we had him, if you know a great dentist, let us know. For as long as we had him, <laughs> he was great, but he's going to be gone this summer. It's a high-trust relationship, but we've seen it's going to be a very transient one, a very temporary one. As believers, there's no greater relationship of trust than our relationship with the Lord Himself. We take Him at His word. We stake our future on His promises. We entrust our very selves to Him for time and for eternity. And at the core of our willingness to do that is the belief that the one whom we trust will never cease to be. The one whom we trust has power over the future so that His promises and His plans can never be frustrated, can never be undermined. Now, it's important for us to see that our confidence is not simply that God is everlasting, so that as long as time endures, He will still be around. No, our confidence goes even further than that. It is that our God is the eternal God, the God who exists beyond time and holds time in His hand. You see, the eternity of God tells us that God's plans are in no way subject to change or to variation of any kind. He is the God who simply is. So when He promises that He will save us at the final day if we belong to Him, He sees that day already. He speaks of what He knows. It is in some sense already present to Him. His power now extends to that coming day, and so His saving work, it is as good as complete. Or to look at it from another angle, when God accepts you and accepts me into His family, when He sets His love upon us, His eternity means that His acceptance of us is in no way dependent upon our future performance. 
it's not as though he might change his mind if down the road we fail him miserably. No, when he saves us, he sees the whole of our lives before his eternal gaze. He knows what we will do. He knows what we will become. And he sets his love upon us despite all the future failings and sins that he knows are yet to come. We believe that the Scripture teaches that true believers cannot lose their salvation, have eternal security. And God's eternity is at the heart of that confidence. The present and future work of God which for us and to our eyes look like a great succession of action, they are actually part of the coherent activity and reality of the eternal God who simply is. Now, I hope we can give time and thought another week to the idea that God does not change, to His immutability. But all this is tied together. They're all related. And the glorious truth, as Hebrews 13 teaches us, is that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. The CBC published an article this week with the reassuring headline, Why the Canada Pension Plan Will Still Be Solvent and Then Some When You Retire. Now, that is very nice to read, <laughs> and we'll all take some comfort from that. But we can all have these niggling doubts about our security for the future in financial terms, can't we? Plenty of company pension pots have been raided, Plenty of retirement plans have run out of money before now. And the truth is, as we all know, anything can happen. But when we entrust ourselves to the eternal God who does not change, who is the same God who holds the end of time in His hand, well, we know that the future is secure. We know that we can stake everything on His promises. One of the great bridges spanning the Ottawa River is the Chaudière Bridge. Supported by great masonry arches, the current bridge and its predecessors have been safely carrying traffic over the Ottawa River for the best part of two centuries. But the recent flooding you may have read or seen if you got caught in a traffic jam down there as we did recently, the recent flooding has compromised the masonry and the bridge has been closed until further notice. And of course, as you look at the raging waters of the river below, the thought of a collapse is too terrible to contemplate, much better to close it. Deuteronomy 33, 27 proclaims to the people of God the supremely comforting truth that the eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Here is our security for time and for eternity. Here is our refuge in the storms of life. Here is our sure and our steadfast hope. We know the one who is eternal, whose arms beneath us are everlasting. The eternity of God gives us confidence. Next, the eternity of God gives us perspective. Notice again the perspective that the psalmist has on his life, on human life, in light of the eternity of God. Psalm 90 and verse 3, you turn men back to dust, saying, Return to dust, O sons of men, for a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by or like a watch in the night. You sweep men away in the sleep of death. They're like the new grass of the morning, though in the morning it springs up new. By evening it is dry and withered. Down to verse 10. The length of our days is 70 years or 80 if we have the strength, yet their span is but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. And then finally, verse 12, teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. We need the perspective of eternity if we are to live wisely in this world. I've mentioned before the legendary businessman Warren Buffett, who is quite an interesting character study on a number of levels. But if you know anything about him, you'll know that the very core of his genius is his long-termism. When asked what is his ideal time frame for holding any given investment, he always says, forever. That's his time frame. While the rest of the crowd are looking at what's happening this week on Wall Street or next week on Bay Street, Buffett is looking decades down the track. His time frame is radically different from the average investor. That's been the key to his success. If we are consumed so much by the things that are immediately before us, the events going on around us today, the pleasures and pursuits of the present time, if that's where our attention lies, as it so often does, we will make bad choices, unwise investments, foolish mistakes. But as we consider our brief lives in light of the one who is eternal, we gain a heart of wisdom. That's what the psalmist sees. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul gives a very interesting exhortation to the believers in Corinth and to us. The immediate context is actually discussion of marriage, and we can't get into the details of that now. But Paul wants us to see that our perspective on everything in the world, marriage included, is shaped by the fact that this world is not eternal. 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 29. What I mean, brothers, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as though they had none. Those who mourn as if they did not, those who are happy as if they were not, those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep, those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed in them. For this world in its present form is passing away. We are all naturally very short-termist in our outlook. We are easily dazzled and consumed by the things immediately before us. But as we look upon the eternal God and hear His promises of a life to come, of heaven above, of a new creation in which we will live with Him, these things lift our eyes to see the bigger picture. These things teach us to number our days aright. These truths give us a heart of wisdom. These things teach us to say no to the pleasures and pursuits of sin, which are so fleeting. They teach us to say no to the idols of this world, which will so quickly pass away. And these realities teach us to value most knowing the eternal God, loving the eternal God, and serving the eternal God. C.S. Lewis captures something of this dynamic in a wonderful little passage in his book, The Weight of Glory. It's often quoted, but it bears repeating. It would seem, says Lewis, that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased, says Lewis. And it's true, isn't it? We all veer toward finding pleasure and fulfillment in the awfully, often measly things immediately before us but because we fail to lift our eyes to see the bigger picture, the eternal picture, the greater joys that the eternal God sets before us. You see, as the eternal God speaks to us in His Word, as He enters our world as a man in the person of His Son, as He does those things, He invites us to receive life eternal, to join Him in His kingdom, which will have no end. And as He does so, in His grace, He teaches us to number our days aright. In His grace, He gives to us a heart of wisdom. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths, a message called The Eternal God. Maybe you came in and joined us a little bit late, or you have to leave early, or you just want to go back and listen to Jonathan's message again. You can always come to our website and listen to each and every broadcast there. You can stream the program or download an MP3 for free. Our website address, EncounterTheTruth.org. That's EncounterTheTruth.org. All right, back to the message. Here is Jonathan. The eternity of God gives us perspective. Next, it gives us warning. Psalm 90 again in verse 11. Who knows the power of your anger? For your wrath is as great as the fear that is due you. As the psalmist reflects upon the sheer immensity of the eternal God, of the scope of His being, of His power, of His glory, he naturally exclaims that this God is capable of wrath, of anger, fitting to His majesty, appropriate to the fear that is due Him. And of course, when we examine the Bible honestly, we see that this is true. We see that the eternal God is capable of wrath that does not end. I think that if we were to take a poll to discover the most unpopular Christian doctrine of all doctrines, I think there would be very, very little competition at the top. The doctrine of the everlasting punishment of the wicked is surely the least popular, the most despised teaching of the Bible. When we do wrong, when we cause hurt and offense in human relationships, we hope that the storm will pass, that the injury will fade, that the wrongdoing will be forgotten. And when it comes to sin before God, we might hope that the passing of time might make our wrongdoing smaller in His sight, that the memory of it might fade, that He might gain some perspective on it. But you see, the eternal God, He sees all of history vividly before Him. 
Psalm 90 reminds us that the eternal God sees all our sin before His eyes. Notice with me from verse 7, we are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins, in the light of your presence. The Puritan Thomas Watson says that the eternity of God is thunder and lightning to the wicked. He goes on, God lives forever, and as long as God lives, He will be punishing the damned. Now, that's not comfortable to think about, not comfortable to hear, but the Bible makes it abundantly clear that it is so. And no one is more frank about these things than the Lord Jesus Himself. Matthew 25 and verse 41, in the parable of the sheep and the goats, then He, the King, will say to those on His left, depart from Me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Mark 9 and verse 47, and if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. The God who judges sin lives forever, and His enemies will never reach the day when they can escape His judgments. Now, these are sobering thoughts. They're frightening thoughts. But for some here today, they will be truths that you need to reckon with in a serious way. Perhaps you're someone who would call yourself a Christian, but you know that you are denying the Lord by your lifestyle. You know that you're rejecting Him by embracing sin, and your Christian profession is an empty one. You're living in active defiance against Him and His Word, and you know it. If that's you, if as I give that outline and paint that portrait, you know full well that that is actually the reality of your life, if that's so, let me urge you, let me actually plead with you to consider what it really means to turn away from the eternal God and to face His unending wrath. Thomas Watson again writes this, thoughts of eternal torments are a good antidote against sin. Sin tempts us with pleasure, but when we think of eternity, it may cool the intemperate heat of lust. Shall I, for the pleasure of sin for a season, endure eternal pain? Is sin committed so sweet as lying in hell forever is bitter? This thought, he says, would make us flee from sin. One of my pastor friends sometimes shares the story of going to see a member of his congregation who was pursuing an adulterous relationship. He was set on leaving his wife for this other woman, and my friend pleaded with him, please don't do this. And the man gave him the most harrowing reply. I would prefer to go to hell, he said, than give up this relationship. The man knew enough of the teaching of the Word of God to know that that was the nature of the choice he was making. He was clear about that. He was rejecting the Word of God. He was willfully denying the eternal judge. He was embracing a punishment that would not end. And he was showing that any Christian profession he had was an empty thing. Friends, if you are living in active, settled rebellion against God today, if you are holding on to some sin which you know defies Him and defies His Word, if you are resisting submitting your life to Him, let me plead with you simply to consider the reality of the eternity of God. There'll be some here today who have never really considered these spiritual truths. You're, you're not a Christian, and you're just exploring these things now. You may feel that you've landed here on a particularly unfortunate Sunday. <laughs> but actually, this is a great week to be among us. We're glad you're here, because these are the very things you need to hear, and these are the very things you need to think about. What could be more important? What could be more urgent and if you haven't turned to the Lord Jesus Christ to receive His gracious offer of forgiveness and life eternal, let me plead with you as well. Take seriously the warnings of the Bible. Don't risk the judgment of the eternal God. The eternity of God, it provides a sober warning for us. But finally, the eternity of God gives us wonderful hope. Again, C.S. Lewis writes of the surprise of the passing of time. Notice how we are perpetually surprised at time, writes Lewis, how time flies. Fancy John being grown up and married. I can hardly believe it. 
in heaven's name, why? Unless, indeed, there is something in us which is not temporal. We're surprised at the passing of time. There's something within us that even mourns the passing of time. It means getting older. It means change. It often means loss. I often think that the pop singer Adele actually captured this quite well in her song when we were young. There's nothing God-fearing about it, but she captures this universal sense of loss, and I think it's why the song was so popular. She writes this, Let me photograph you in this light, in case it is the last time that we might be exactly like we were before we realized. We were sad of getting old. It made us restless. Oh, I'm so mad I'm getting old. It makes me reckless. It was just like a movie. It was just like a song when we were young. There's something about the passing of time that surprises us and that saddens us. And the Scriptures tell us why. We all find this hard because Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 11, he has set eternity in the hearts of men. The great poet Tennyson captures this instinct, this sense in his own day, saying, Thou wilt not leave us in the dust. Thou madest man, he knows not why. He thinks he was not made to die. And thou hadst made him. Thou art just. We feel we were not made to die. We long for eternity. We long for life which lasts, for a reality that will endure beyond this passing world, not subject to change, not subject to variation, to loss, to decay. We all know that longing, and the answer to it is not found in the sports car or the plastic surgery of the midlife crisis. It's not found in wealth or success or fame. It's not found in any of the other things we might pursue to fill this void. It's not found anywhere in this world. It's found only in the eternal God, the one who himself holds time in his hand. You and I will never become eternal creatures in the sense that God is eternal. We had a beginning. We are time-bound, and presumably we will remain so. But here's what we can do. We can know and relate to the eternal God who has the power to give us life that will not end. In John chapter 17 and verse 3, Jesus tells us that eternal life is tied to knowing the eternal God. Now, this is eternal life, says Jesus, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. The eternal God came into the world in the person of His Son, And the Son of God Himself gave His life to pay the debt of our sin, the price of our wrongdoing, that we might be set free from the judgment of sin, from the terror of hell, and be released for an endless future of joy with Him. I wonder if you know this eternal God this morning. I wonder if you know Him yourself. I wonder if you've come to Him for life eternal through His Son, whom he sent into the world. The promises of God are very great, and the warnings of God are very terrible. But for those who know him, he is our dwelling place, he is our refuge, and he is our eternal hope. Jonathan Griffiths wrapping up our message, The Eternal God, here on Encounter the Truth. And our message today is the first in a series, Who is Like Our God? If you ever happen to miss a broadcast in the series, I want you to know you can always come to the website and listen to each and every program online. Our website address is EncounterTheTruth.org. And while you're there, I want to ask you to consider giving a gift. We stay on the station because of your financial support. But as you give a gift of any amount this month, we want to send you a book called Heaven, How I Got Here. It's the story of the thief on the cross, and it's really a first-person account of the thief looking back from heaven some 2,000 years to what happened on that day he was crucified next to Jesus. It's really a, a great book to help you understand that entrance into heaven is truly and completely dependent upon Jesus' finished work on the cross. We'd love to send you a copy of this book as you give a gift of support of any amount. You can find out more or give online at EncounterTheTruth.org or call us at 833-99-TRUTH. That's 833-998-7884 or EncounterTheTruth.org. 
Well, thanks for listening today, and I hope you'll join us next time.